glad to see you in the church. And I would like to invite Pastor Jeremy. Um, Pastor Jeremy will share the Word of God with us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I've got three pieces of technology here. So, do I use one of these? No. I don't need a microphone? No. Okay, I will walk around. <laughs> okay. How are you all? Good. Good. Some of you are good. Some of you are still asleep. <laughs> Bernice and I are delighted to be here. You want me to hold it? Yeah. Okay. We're delighted to be with you back at uh, GLOW. I was uh, standing there thinking about uh, our, the next few weeks of our ministry. So today, here we are at an Indonesian church. Next Sunday, we are in the Riverland in Renmark, where there is a Pacific Island of fellowship. Tongans, Fijians, Samoans. Um, you want to hear them sing. Whoa, all men. And that's next week. The following week, I'm in Singapore. Ask me why I'm going there. For the food. <laughs> no, 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 joke. Just a joke. And then the following week, I'm in the Philippines. So you should say, Jeremy, you do get around. Since we were last with you, uh, we've written a new book called The Powerful Words of Jesus. And some of you last year bought our book on miracles, and it looks almost identical to this. It certainly is the same format, uh, in large print, small paragraphs, clear English, written in the vocabulary of maybe uh, an Australian teenager. So uh, you will not find this difficult to understand. Each chapter is four pages long. Takes about six or seven minutes to read and would make an ideal daily devotional. So if you went to Kurong, this book would cost you $29.95. But you can buy it today for $20. Oh, that is a good deal. Okay. Maybe $19.95. <laughs> Is that a better deal? Better deal. Yeah. Better deal. Okay, so uh, I brought some with me. Please see Bernice afterwards. I notice the time is 10.25. What time do you want me to finish? What time would you like me to finish? <laughs> lunch. <laughs> when is lunch? <laughs> when we're hungry. Okay. I love <clears throat> a love story. Anybody like love stories? I like movies or books with happy endings. I like the hero to get the girl and to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. I love a love story. Is anybody with me and say, Jeremy, I love love stories as well? Okay, we've got one answer from Bernice and one answer from Jeremy. So there's two of you that love love stories and the rest of you are thinking, what's for lunch today? <laughs> so um, I do need you to help me. So when I go like this, I want you to say 10 generations. Let's try it. 10 gener not 10 years. Ten generations. A generation might be 30 years. So ten generations could be 300 years. And then from time to time in my, in my talk with you, there's going to be bad news. At that point, I want you to say, oh, no. Let's try that. Oh, oh no. No, no, no. <laughs> How could I describe this? 
The, this is like you've invited someone round for a dinner and you've burnt the rice. Oh. oh, no. So you're doing well. So when I go like this, oh. ten, ten generations. And when it's bad news, oh. oh, no, we've burnt the rice. The Bible has some wonderful love stories. There is the love story of Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, he was the promised son, but he had no wife. And through an amazing incident, uh, Abraham sends off his servant, travels a thousand kilometers. They haven't been there for 60 years and uh, locates Rebecca. She is beautiful and she is willing. Uh, that's good news. That's not bad news. That's good news. And of course, they f it's, it's a great story. And then there is the story of Jacob and, uh, uh, Jacob and Rachel. And Jacob was the guy that got married and woke up the next day with the wrong girl. Oh, that, that, okay, let's try that again. Jacob was the man that got married and woke up the next morning with, an, with the wrong girl. But the Bible says that he loved Rachel so much that the seven extra years he had to serve for her was but a short period of time. But that left the wrong. You see, the older sister was ugly. She had a, oh no. She had a problem with her eyes. And uh, you know, now she is trapped in a loveless marriage, but wins her husband's love. And eventually when, when, when they pass away, uh, Jacob says, I want you to bury me, not with Rachel, but with Leah. Don't you love a love story? Of course, there is a whole book in the Bible that is a love poem between the husband and the wife. It's called the Song of Songs. Now, I expect, Pastor Jeremy, that you should be reading this every night for the next six months because it talks about the nice... I presume this is Ratna here, is it? You are sitting by the right one. You're not going to wake up with the wrong one, are you? Um, so... so so, so the, the th oh no, the the thing about uh, the the thing about uh, love is that love has to be expressed. You have to learn to say nice things to one another. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Oh, is is it? We had not rehearsed that. Uh, the greatest love story in the Bible. It is the love story between Jesus and his church. We have no idea how much Jesus loves his church. He is passionate about the church. Now that is the church global, but the church local. Let me say to you that Jesus is passionate about Glow Fellowship. Thank you for your response to that. Uh, okay. But the, the love story I want to talk to you about today is a man called Boaz and a lady called Ruth. Boaz was a Jew. Ruth was a Moabitess. Oh, no. Let's try that again. <laughs> Boaz was a Jew and Ruth was a Moabitess. Oh, no. What's the problem? Oh, the problem is this. If you marry a person from Moab, Moab, then for ten generations, your children are not allowed in the temple. Wow. Oh, wow. So, so here is Boaz, a Jew, and here is Ruth, a Moabitess. He is a man who was never married, and she is a widow. He is incredibly wealthy, and this woman is in absolute poverty. So let me introduce to you the family. And uh, here is their family tree. And it starts with a man called Elimelech, who married Naomi. Elimelech was a, a man who lived in the town of Bethlehem. Famous, of course, because that's where Jesus was born. 
He was a wealthy man and he had a large plot of land, a large uh, holding. He married a lady called Naomi, whose name means pleasant and pretty. Now that's a nice name, isn't it? Would you prefer to be called pretty or ugly? Well, Elimelech well, <laughs> married Naomi, whose name meant uh, pretty. And they're living in Bethlehem. They have two sons. Their names are Marlon and Kilion. But then, oh no. And then, oh no. there is a famine in Bethlehem. So what does the limit? There's no food. There's no crops. The crops in the field have failed. And they're going to they're gonna go through starvation. So Elimelech makes the decision that he will leave Bethlehem and travel some 10 days walk to the land of Moab. That really is a big oh no. Oh no. You see, here's the truth. Don't get out of the train in the tunnel. Don't jump ship in the storm. If the plane you're flying in goes through turbulence, where is the safest place? Inside the plane or on the wing? Inside. Inside. So don't leave Bethlehem, the name means house of bread, in a famine. This is a really bad decision. And so they travel to Moab, a seven-day walk, and two things happen. First of all, they only plan to go for a little while, but they stay 10 years. Oh, we'll just go for 10 weeks. They stay for 10 years. The devil will always deceive you. When you walk away from God, the devil will, instead of just a little while, 10 years. And of course, in those 10 years, the sons marry Moabite girls. But there's a problem there. What's the problem? Ten generations, Ten generations of a curse. Oh, you might be from Bethlehem. You might be of the tribe of Judah. You might have a large land holding in Bethlehem, but your sons have married Moabite girls. And this means they are cursed for 10 generations. Marlon marries a lady called Ruth and Killian marries a lady called Orpah. Then the unthinkable happens. No, 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 come on, help me. Then the unthinkable happens. Oh, no. Elimelech dies. Naomi is now a widow. She's living in a Gentile country. She's widowed. And then it even gets worse. Oh, no. Because both sons die before they have any children. Oh, oh no. Uh, the problem is this. Who is going to inherit the land back in Bethlehem? Uh, Naomi is widowed. She's childless. She has no money. And there is no one to continue the family line. And she may lose the family land. So Naomi plans to return to Bethlehem. And she calls her, her daughters-in-law and says, I'm going home. You might as well stay here in your home. And, uh, and Orpah leaves. But Ruth said, I'm not leaving you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you sit down, I will sit down. Where you die, that's where I will die. Where they bury you, that's where I will be buried. And your God is my God. And so it says that Naomi returned from Moab with Ruth, arriving in Bethlehem. Read this with me, please. Arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. The ladies didn't realize that there was a miracle in the harvest because Ruth would meet somebody that would change her life forever. And it came through the harvest. This is what you have to believe at Glow Church, that over the next 12 months, people will come in and find Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. And there will be a miracle in that harvest. Yes. 
because some of those people that come in will become preachers and pastors and youth workers and musicians. There is a miracle in the harvest. Whoopee. Now, uh, Israel had a law, a law for all the farmers. And this law was, you are not allowed to harvest right to the edge of your field. You must leave a margin all around the field. And that allows the poor and the alien, the refugee, to find food if they needed food. And it was, the English word is gleaning. I have no idea what that is in Bahasa. Well, what's the Bahasa word for gleaning? Tell us, Pastor Jeremy. You're a pastor and you know everything. <laughs> Never mind. It's not in the... Do you understand that they could go and collect? Yes, that's the word. <laughs> and so here they are. The women... Naomi and Ruth, both widows, have no house to live in. They have no money for food. And Ruth is so poor that she goes out to gather the leftovers. Ruth qualified because she was poor and she was an alien. But Naomi doesn't go with her. She's either too old or too proud, too ashamed of what has happened to her. And then it says, amazingly, that it turned out by chance that Ruth found herself gleaning in a field belonging to Boaz. There's nothing special in Ruth going out to, to gather the, the leftovers. But what was special was that she was in a field of a man who would change her life forever. And she didn't know. If there's a miracle in the, in the harvest, there is also a miracle in the every day. Maybe this week you've just got to go back to college, go back to university, go back to your studies. Maybe you've got to go back to work and, and it's just, you know, boring, boring, boring every day. Let me tell you something. When you know Jesus Christ in a powerful way, every day has the potential for a miracle. Oh, Ruth, you, you don't know who he is and you don't know where you are, but God is working in your life. So let me talk to you about Boaz. I think that Boaz was about 60 years of age and he was single. 60 and single. No dating apps, you know, no websites that 60-year-old men could go and, and find a wife. You know, he couldn't, you know, <laughs> he was 60. And why? I mean, had there been no opportunities? Maybe there had been relationships, but they had been fractured, broken. Whatever it is, Boaz is 60. He's wifeless and childless. But Boaz has an amazing history. He lives in Bethlehem. He's of the tribe of Judah. And I wonder if you know the name of his mother. Anybody know the name of the mother of Boaz? Well, her name was Rahab. Does anybody know who Rahab was? Where did Rahab live? In Jericho. What did she do for a job? She was a prostitute. You know, she, she was the worst considered person in the town of Jericho. And Joshua said, you know the story, uh, how the, the town is going to be destroyed. Uh, Rahab shows kindness to the spies and they say, have a scarlet cord, throw it out of your window and you will be spared. And Rahab saved her family. She marries the guy from Israel uh, and they produce, what an incredible history that, that uh, uh, Boaz has. But even though he has a great history, he has an uncertain future because he's 60 and single. No wife, no children. He has a large property, but he has nobody to inherit it, nobody to leave it to. Somebody else would take it from him. Thirdly, Boaz was wealthy. Oh, he wasn't just wealthy. He was seriously wealthy. He owned a large block of land. 
he employed many men to work in the field and many women to work there. And there were so many people that he had a supervisor over his workers. This guy is seriously rich. Uh, the Bible says that he was a man of great wealth. But here is the interesting thing. Boaz was cousin to Elimelech. Elimelech is the wife, the husband of Naomi. And therefore, Marlon and Kilion were his nephews. And there is an obligation. Ask me, Jeremy, what was the obligation? Okay, this was, I'm glad you're listening to me. So I'm going to preach to you now. So, so this is what it was. If a man died before he had any children, his brother would marry his wife. Let me say that to you again. The guy owns property, but before he has a child, he dies. His brother would then take his widow and marry her. Do you understand that? With the purpose of having a son, so the original man's name would not be forgotten. This was an obligation. Shall I tell you, do you understand this? So, so when Naomi comes back to Bethlehem and uh, the town are amazed, they say, what happened to the pleasantness? What happened to your pretty face? And she said, I went out full. God brought me back empty. Don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. And the whole town was amazed. She said, I've come back empty, but it wasn't true. She had brought Ruth with her, a Moabitess. Everybody say, she brought back a Moab. What's the problem? Ten generations. Ten generations of a curse. Oh, but then the people of the town noticed how kind Ruth was to Naomi, how supportive she was, how caring she was. And the town is saying, wow, that this Moabitess, even though she's under a curse, she is showing such kindness to Naomi. And Boaz heard about it. Well, let me talk to you about Ruth. She's a Moab. I think she was about 25 years old and a widow. She's living now in a strange country to her. She's had to learn another language, eat different food. And now she's working like as a, a slave, you know. She, she's working at the, the lowest job, gathering up all the leftovers. And she's so poor that she has to glean and gather in the fields to provide for her mother in land, mother-in-law. And then, <clears throat> by chance, she goes to the field of Boaz. Well, Boaz goes out into the field. He's got lots of workers. He wants to check how they are doing. And when he's out there, he notices somebody. Ah, who's that young woman? Who does she belong to? Who's, uh, whose wife is she? Whose servant is she? Is she married? Is she a slave of somebody else? And, and he inquired with, the, uh, with the, the supervisor and said, who is that young woman? And the supervisor said, that is Ruth, the Moabitess. And Boaz said, oh, I've heard about her. I've heard about how kind she has been. Now, remember that Boaz and Elimelech were cousins. And so uh, he said uh, I, I, to himself, I've heard what a, what, how kind she is. And the supervisor said, not only is she kind, but she is a very hard worker. She hasn't been chasing the guys. She's just been working as hard as you could, you could get. And Boaz goes to, to speak to, uh, to Ruth. And this is what he says. May the Lord repay you. May you re be rewarded by the Lord under whose wings you will find refuge. I want you to say those last few words with me. 
under whose wings you will find refuge. Boaz says, there is a place under the wings of God that you can find shelter. I know you are a widow. I know that you are poor, but you've shown great kindness to your mother-in-law and God will reward you and there will be a place for you. Don't you love a love story? Then Boaz says this to her, don't go into any other field, stay in this field. The reason, because in other people's fields, I cannot guarantee your safety. You're 25, you're really beautiful to look upon, and there will be men, workers in the other fields who will take you and abuse you. You need to stay in my field, and, and you need to, uh, I've told my workers to look after you. Remember, he said, I'm, I believe that God will reward you, and you will find a place under his wings. Then Boaz said, uh, let's have afternoon tea. I've got some fresh bread and I've got some olive oil and we can dip the bread into the olive oil and there's also some uh, vinegar and we can mix that with it. It's really, don't you love a love story? Now, now uh, Boaz, 60 and single, Ruth, 25. I think he's thinking, what would a young woman like this ever be interested in an old man like me? But nevertheless, love, don't you love a love story? And then he says, I've got some roasted grain. It's really yummy. And so I think that was quite a long afternoon tea as they talk and share and eat. And, and then she goes back to work and Boaz says to her, his servants, make sure that where she is working, there's plenty of things for her to gather. So much so that, that, that when Ruth went back to Naomi that evening, she had 14 kilos of barley. That's a pretty big amount. And then, then she said, oh, I've also got some leftover roasted grain. The, the owner gave it to me. It was really nice. And Naomi said, whose field did you glean in? Where did you do this gathering? Uh, and uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth says, oh, I, I think the man's name is Boaz. And the hairs on the back of Naomi's hair, neck stood up. And her heart began to pound. And her spirit began to lift because she said, oh, that man is a near kinsman. He has an obligation to Elimelech and Marlon, and to me and to you. This is not by chance. <laughs> Don't you love a love story? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> when I was 14, God called me to be a pastor. You should all say, wow. wow. So, so this is what I thought. If I'm going to be a pastor, I need a pastor's wife. <laughs> Is that fair enough? Yes. So I went to this youth rally, maybe four or five hundred young people, and across a crowded room. Oh. Oh. oh, don't you love a love story? Doesn't that make the hair on your neck stand up and your heart pound? <laughs> what was it? His name was Boaz. Oh, there is an obligation. And I think Ruth is thinking, ha, oh, it's more than an obligation. That man is attracted to me. And I must confess, I'm attracted to him. And so Naomi said, this is what you must do. Because now the harvest is drawing to an end. They will start threshing the, 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 the stalks. That's a good word, threshing. Everybody say, threshing. threshing. What they would do is that they would uh, get, 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 they would toss the, uh, the stalks into the air and the wind would blow away the uh, chaff 
and the, the grain would fall to the ground. And then they would, they would work with it, so all they were left with was the, the grain. Can, can you understand that? And so uh, Naomi said, I want you to go to Boaz's threshing floor, the grain store. Don't let anybody see you. Go there late in the afternoon. And after they've eaten and they've, uh, you know, that they've parted together because it's an exciting uh, time, uh, Boaz will go and lie down. And then I want you to go, not into his bed, but I want you to go and uncover the, his feet and lie down at his feet. And this is what you are to say. You are my near kinsman. Would you put your garment over me? And it happened exactly like that. You know, that th there is the harvest, that's, they're gathering the grain. You know, there's lots of people there. They have wonderful food. And then that they are weary, they're tired. There's probably been some singing and maybe dancing. And probably around about seven, eight o'clock, Boaz goes down to, uh, you know, he, he lies. He's now asleep. And in the darkness of the barn, he becomes aware that somebody is lying at his feet. Who is it? And he says, who are you? And Ruth says, I am your servant Ruth. Boaz, there is attraction and there is obligation. And then Ruth says this, would you extend your garment over me? You promised me that there would be a place under the wings of God for me. Will you make room in your life? W would you extend your garment over me? And right there and then, Boaz becomes aware. Yes, he's attracted to this girl. Yes, he's thinking to himself, why would this beautiful young girl uh, want me, an old man? Uh, why could I ever think that? And then the obligation that he has to Elimelech and Naomi and the boys. And there's the land that Naomi is about to sell. And, and Boaz is aware that, that he's got an obligation, but it's mixed with attraction. And this girl has not got into her, his bed. That's not the basis for marriage. The basis for marriage is more than obligation and more than attraction. It's the choice of the will. So when you get married, I hear you getting married next year, Jeremy. You, you didn't discuss this with, you didn't discuss this with Bernice and I. I mean, you've said, oh, you're like a father to us. But anyway, there you go. So when you get married, the minister will not say, are you obliged? He won't say, are you attracted? He will say, will you? Because Boaz then makes a powerful statement. And here it is. Show me the next slide, please. And, and don't you love a love story? Oh, okay, here we go. Show me the next slide, please. Here's the powerful statement that Boaz makes. There's a problem. Oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. There's a problem. I'm not the closest relative. Oh, no. There is somebody closer who has first claim on you and the land. And if he, if he wants to claim the land, good. Wow. Sorry? <laughs> what did you say? Lovely. It is. Because love never makes demands. Did you hear what I said? Love is a choice. And Boaz says this, I'm very attracted to you and I have an obligation, but somebody has first call. And if he's willing, I want the best for you. Good. 
What an amazing statement. I now have a problem. Oh, no. I need to blow my nose. Oh, no. Hold that. Everybody, please cough when I blow my nose. <laughs> oh. That is so much better. Then he says this. I'm under an obligation, but Ruth, you are not. I want the best for you. So this is what a marriage is based on. I love you, and I want the best for you. And I love you, and I want the best for you. Don't you love a love story? <laughs> because, <laughs> because if it's all about me, it's not a marriage. And it's all about you, it's not a marriage. But when I want the best for you and you want... So, so here is Boaz. He's attracted. There's an obligation. But then there's somebody that's closer. Oh, no. Show me the next slide. Here is the choice. Because then Boaz says, I will do it. Powerful statement. If he's not willing, I will do it. It's not just the obligation. It's not just the attraction. But it is the choice of the will. I will do it. And then he says, uh, stay where you are. Don't get into my bed. Now, remember, he's the boss. He's the owner. He could easily have abused her. But he says, I want you to stay where you are. And before the sun breaks... I want you to leave because I don't want anyone to see you. Not that I am ashamed of you, but because I want to preserve your reputation. So now she leaves. And then the first thing in the morning, show me the next slide. Uh, I'm getting excited. And the time is going, isn't it? This is, okay. First, everybody say, first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. He goes to the gate of the city. Some of the elders, the city council are there and other witnesses. And he says, guys, I've got an important announcement. Stay here while I get my cousin. And he goes and finds the man who is closer to Elimelech than what he is. And he says to him, you know, our cousin Elimelech has died and his son Marlon has died. And Naomi has come back and she has no money. And she is about to sell the land. And you have the first choice. And the man said, I will buy it. Thank you. And the man said, I will buy it. And then Boaz says this, oh, there's not just the land. There's a lady because Marlon has got ma married. He married a Moabites. Ten, generation. Ten generations of curse. And uh, if you get the land, the lady comes with it. And not just the lady, but you've got to give her a son. So the land you buy will actually go back to Elimelech and Marlon's family. And the guy says, I think this will damage my property portfolio. I want the land, but I don't want the lady. And this is what Boaz says. In front of all the, the, the city council and the witnesses, and he says this, today, right now, today, you are witnesses that I have bought the land and taken Ruth the Moabite, Moabite eyes. More, more eyes than you. What, what did I say? Moabite as my wife. Then he did something very interesting. Because this was a Jewish culture. When a man was under obligation but wouldn't take the lady. Boaz says, give me your sandal. He takes, no, I don't have any holes in my socks. It's okay. <laughs> For the rest of that man's life, he would have to wear only one sandal. 
And everybody in the town would say, oh, there's the man of the family of the one sandal. What was the man's name? Doesn't tell us. He disappears from the pages of history. He could have been in the family line, but he was only interested in himself. And for the rest of his life, everybody says, look at that crazy guy. He's only got one sandal on. So, good story. I've got to put my shoe back on. <laughs> there was a motor, there was a... Anyway. There we go. So let me talk to you about the outcome. Show me the next slide. So this is the reward. Because Boaz marries Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> they get married. They have a child. His name is Obed. Everybody say Obed. 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 Obed, eventually, he grows up. He gets married. He has a child. And his name is Jesse. Jesse. Jesse gets married when he grows up. He has a child. He has about eight of them. And the eighth one was a little shepherd boy called David. David gets married. He has a few as well. But his favorite son was Solomon. Ten generations of curse. But in the purposes of God, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, Solomon, five generations, the curse is broken forever. Yes. And Solomon bought, built this magnificent temple. And in the portico, in the porch, there were two beautiful pillars. And Solomon engraved a two names there. One name was uh, Jakia, which meant strength, and the other one was Boaz. Can you see a little boy in the temple with his dad and saying, Dad, these pillars, Boaz, who was that? And his dad would say, he's the reason why we are here today. He's the reason why this temple has been built. He was the near kinsman who took a risk in marrying a Moabitess and finding her way into the family of God. Because if you trace it through, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, Solomon, all the way down to Jesus Christ. Don't you love a love story? Okay, show me the next slide, please. <coughs> Better hurry up because lunch is calling. <laughs> so what's this all about? Boaz was what is called a kinsman redeemer. And the kinsman redeemer had to be three things. Number one, he had to be a close relative. Number two, he had to be financially able to pay the debts. Number three, he had to be willing. Remember the other guy, the no-name man? Uh, he was a closer relative. Uh, he also was wealthy, but he was not willing. Show me the next slide. Because this is a picture of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He came near to us. Religion is man trying to find God, but Christianity is God finding us. And Jesus came down. God of very God became man of very man. He became our close relative. He lived with us, walked with us, talked with us. And Jesus, is he able? Is he rich enough? Is he strong enough? Yes, he is able. <coughs> What's he able to do? <coughs> He's able to cleanse every sin. He's able to break every chain. He's able to break the curse. Oh, you're a Moabitess. You're cursed for 10 generations. 
But when Boaz comes, the curse is broken. And let me tell you, we were under the curse of sin that brought death and fear and anxiety and sickness and, and death and all those things. But when Jesus came, he broke the curse yeah. and replaced them with blessing. Amen. And he was willing. In the darkness of the grain store, while Boaz is asleep, in comes Ruth, lies at his feet. Who are you? I am Ruth, your near kinsman. Would you extend your coat over me? Is there a place for a Moabitess in your plans? In the darkness of the grain store and in the darkness of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me, but not my will. Your will be done. Yes. Hallelujah. Don't you love a love story? He was willing. Show me the next slide, please. I think this is pretty much the end. Why don't we say right now, Jesus... Will you extend the corner of your garment? Jesus, is there room in your kingdom for me? Is there a place under your wings that I can find refuge? Lord, I'm penniless. I'm a widow. Everything's go everything that could go wrong has gone wrong for my life. I I'm under this curse of being from Moab. Oh, is there room for me? Here's the good news. There is place in God's kingdom for every one of us. And his grace reaches us. And his love touches us. And his mercy transforms us. And his salvation includes everyone. Yeah. So when Jesus died on the cross, what did they do with his arms? Stretch them out wide. And Jesus was saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. To the widowed Moabites, there's a place in my kingdom. And the thief dying next to him said, Lord, will you remember me? Is there a place for a thief? In, this day you will be with me. Do you remember the Ethiopian in the desert that Philip met? He was disappointed with religion and Philip preaches Jesus to him. He comes to, the, to a pool of water and he says, can I be baptised? Is there room under the wings of God for an Ethiopian? And Philip said, if you believe, I will baptise you. Because there's room in the kingdom for me. I think there's one more slide. Uh, quickly, quickly, hurry up, hurry up. Faster, 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 faster. There's no more. What did you do with it? <laughs> did you delete it? If you're a husband or a father, or if you're engaged to be married, I want you to put your hand over your heart right now. Lord, I pray for these men on this Father's Day. I pray, Lord, that you would put this spirit that was on Boaz into these men's hearts so that their relationship is not about them. It's about you. Lord, I pray that you will fill their heart with love for their partner and their children. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, there are obviously guys here today that aren't married. Are you married yet? Did you get married since I was here last? Not yet. We're going to call you Boaz. Because you're going to go out and see a girl in the field working. What's her name? Ruth. She's from Moab. Oh no. And your love will break the curse over her life. What a great story that is. 
But now I want you to, all of us, just to put our hands like this. You know, if you do this to God, you cannot receive from Him. You're angry. But when you open your hands, you're saying, I receive you. Bow your heads, would you please? I'm going to pray. Lord, every one of us have stood where Ruth stood. Brokenhearted. Robbed in life. Broken and penniless. But Lord, you are Jesus. You are our kinsman redeemer. And you come to save and deliver. And there is room under your wings for us. There's a place in your kingdom for us. And we receive your love. We receive your grace. We receive your mercy. Jesus, we thank you. You came to where we were. You are so able to do it. And you are willing. And so today, Jesus, we love you. We love you. Lord, I pray that you will break every curse that's been spoken over us. Things that people have said and spoken of. Ten generations of curses broken by the kinsman redeemer. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I love you. You know, right now I can sense the presence of God in this room. And he wants to extend his coat over you. And if you sense God softening your heart and you want to experience the Father's love and the Son's care, just right now, stand to your feet where you are. Stand up and say, Jesus, oh, you are my kinsman redeemer. If God's touching you, just respond right now. for preaching so long. It was because you kept interrupting me. Oh, no. Okay, who's doing what now, Pastor?